Uh, as I look at the passage before us this morning, Proverbs chapter 2, thinking about the value of wisdom, that there are rewards and consequences to when wisdom is valued and received and it's seen as something that we should want to obtain. And this passage also outlines kind of the consequences for when we could really care less about whether we're wise or not. And it got me thinking, you know, when you've heard enough sermons, and maybe this has been true of my preaching at some point, that Christian preaching, talk about discipleship today, um, is prone to shy away from the dramatic appeals that are made in Proverbs. You know, we can say things as a matter of bare facts, like, you need to be holy as he is holy. Walk in the ways of Jesus. Walk in a manner worthy of the kingdom of God. And we say all these phrases, and despite their biblical origin, they are so overused that we hardly know what they mean. I could tell you, walk in a manner worthy of God, and you're going to go, how? By contrast, I think most of the Bible, especially Proverbs, we see the obedient life is actually portrayed in metaphorical terms, dramatic terms. That human life in God's world is not just a set of ideas, but it's understood through the lives of characters, stories, vibrant messages that are to grab our attention speak to our emotions, and involve us. The reason why I think so many people can find the Bible to be irrelevant is because they do not place themselves in it. They don't think the story can be about them. Many of you here today might have heard sermons on Jesus' parables about you know, the pearl of great price or the lost coin Maybe a, the treasure that was hidden in a field. You think of the parable, and you're like, who would leave their treasure just sitting in a field? You know, if I find it, isn't that stealing? <laughs> you may have read so many times Christ's Sermon on the Mount that, yeah, we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And another way of looking at it, I want us to ask the same question of our pursuit of wisdom. Is this how we treat wisdom? Is it like finding a pearl of great price? Possessing a lost coin, a treasure hidden in a field? Do we pursue the knowledge of God? Are we actively trying to understand the fear of the Lord? Or do we have a, well, now that I'm saved, what else is there to worry about kind of attitude? Why would I have to concern myself with these things? I'm saved. I'm good now, right? And so I I hope this morning I can encourage all of you. This passage gives us a wonderful list of statements, some conditional statements that if we pursue wisdom, if we pursue it actively, there are great rewards. But if we don't, Um, there are pretty detrimental consequences, uh, whether we're ignorant or just indifferent toward God and spiritual things. And I think this passage shows us three rewards. The first reward is wisdom itself. Who wouldn't want that? Second reward is sanctified desires, and then there's also a reward of physical blessings. So we get wisdom itself, We get new desires that are holy, and we also have the physical blessings that flow from that. And so verses 1 through 11, we find a word, a reward of wisdom itself. And I'm thankful you might be looking at it and you're like, I don't know how he's going to break this up. But the first half of this poem 1 through 11, actually can be broken up in three ways. So we have verses 1 through 4, and these are the ifs. 
And if you ever remember from grammar class, if then statements, if this is true, then this is true. But if this is not true, then this is not true. It's conditional. Something has to happen first. And so verses 1 through 4 give us the list of ifs the sun must meet in order to get wisdom. Verses 5 through 8, this is the first list of thens. It forms a single sentence that holds, you know, the fear of the Lord, knowledge of God together in practical ways. And the verses 9 through 11, the second list of thens, reminds us that if we seek to know the Lord, if we walk in wisdom, then God will lead us in a path of righteousness, justice, equity, every good path. You know, and I'm reading this, and it, it really does, you know, the ideas of knowing God. You hear the fear of the Lord. I think they strike our ears differently than they might have to the original audience. You know, a lot of modern Christians, we talk about knowing God sentimentally or as a matter of inner feeling. And not that that's not valid, but true knowledge of the Lord emerges actually when we imitate Him. You know Him because you are trying to live like Him. It's this knowledge that's measured by actions rather than just speech. Actions that lead us to deeper experience of who He is, true discernment, true justice, true righteousness. In fact, we're promised, this is verse 5, that you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Why is that? Because the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice and watching over the way of his saints. This assures us of the protection that he promises to those who seek the knowledge of God that want to live, who want to live a wise way of living. Quite frankly, they want to embody verses 9 through 11. They want to be those who understand righteousness, injustice, equity, every good path, those for whom wisdom will come into their hearts. Knowledge will be pleasant to their souls, discretion will watch over you, understanding will guard you. For any of those, and this is me, um, who struggle with self-control, so everybody, um, you just got to think about what you're trying to control. This prayer should be a prayer for all of us. I want this to be a reality for all of us, that wisdom would actually come into my heart. The knowledge would be pleasant to me. Discretion would watch over me. Understanding would guard me. You watch what you say. I think many of us, we've, you know, we've been asked by family, friends, co-workers, people who aren't Christians, you know, how do you know Christianity is true? How do you know Jesus is real? How do you know the Bible is real? And I'm thankful because this is verse 1, right? My son, if you receive my words, if you treasure up my commandments with you, if you make your ear attentive to wisdom, if you incline your heart to understand, yes, if you call out for insight and you raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, if you search for it, as for hidden treasures, verse 5, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And you will find the knowledge of God. It's a promise. Paul uses similar language in the New Testament. He said, when he tells us to increase our knowledge of Christ, it actually requires sharing in Christ's suffering, striving for the upward call, avoiding earthly passions, rejoicing in everything, but practicing all that Paul has taught 
imitate me as I imitate Christ. That the imitation of Christ and our experience of him go hand in hand. In short, if you want to know Christ, if you want to know wisdom, if you live like wisdom himself, you live like Christ. This is an if-then statement that if we are promised, or we are promised that if we receive Christ, we retain Christ, we attend to Christ, we pray to Christ, we value Christ, then you will receive wisdom. Retain wisdom, attend to wisdom, pray for wisdom, value wisdom. Quite frankly, if you're looking for wisdom, you don't have wisdom. It's because you don't have Christ. For to have him is to have all things. When we find Christ, we find wisdom. And if we have wisdom, we will find Christ. That is a wonderful reward in and of itself. But it doesn't just stop there. You don't just get the gift. I remember on Christmas morning, could you imagine being given a gift and then you just don't want to play with it? You don't want anything to do with it? It's like, well, I just want to look at it. I'm glad I have it. No, it's to be applied and used and enjoyed. And so if we're receiving the reward of wisdom, if we have received Christ, we have received wisdom, through the knowledge of his word and the Holy Spirit, then that should lead us to do something with it. The second reward, what comes from wisdom, is the reward of sanctified desires. In the second half of the poem, this is verses 12 through 19, we see two major threats to the young person who's emerging into adulthood. And you're thinking, well, I don't know if I'm emerging, Dave, into adulthood. But this is so relevant even to us today. Two threats, bad social relations, and believe it or not, sexual temptation. We learn elsewhere in Scripture that the companion of fools will suffer harm. Bad company ruins good morals. And so I think there's such an immense power social groups can have. Certainly on a child's formation, you know, their worldview and their behavior. But I don't think this is any less true for adults. I mean, I, I don't want us to close ourselves off into social groups that are just like us all the time. We know the gospel welcomes people of every tribe, nation, places a burden on us to reach out to the marginalized of society. Instead, what I think is in view here is when we gather around the water coolers and the coffee makers, when we follow friends and trends on social media, when we align ourselves with people who affirm our social, moral, and political leanings. Yes, we are all naturally drawn to people you know, who look like us, and think like us. I get it. Um, and yet the son is warned to be more discerning than that. Avoid frequenting the company of those who abuse power, people, and property. If you look at verse 12, he says, This wisdom, the wisdom that the Lord gives, will deliver you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of unrightness, uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil. They delight in the perverseness of evil. Men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Wisdom keeps us from bad social relations that hamper godly thinking. Goodness, you know, if you have, you know, Decent parents, you've had a good relationship with your parents. You know, I always thought my parents just didn't want me to have fun. Okay? They were total buzz kills. They, they were sent by God, put on this earth to make my life miserable. You know, and, uh, you know, being the young teenager I was, you know, I just 
crawl in my room, hey, my wife, I want to run away, you know, and cranking some punk rock music, you know, and just, I have it so bad. I had it so rough. Um, it's because they loved me. They saw that I was surrounding myself with a crowd that they did not have my best interests in mind. Um, and it's not like they were just trying to protect me because I was their precious little glass baby vase thing. I don't even know what that was. <laughs> but they were protecting me. Um, I was precious in their sight, but it wasn't like they had to bubble wrap me. But they saw the path. They saw that these were kids that did not care about the person I would grow up to be. This father to his son says, find the Lord, fear him, find the knowledge. He gives wisdom to keep you safe, to give you a long life you know, for all intents and purposes. Second, he warns the son, avoid the forbidden woman. I'm so thankful. You know, Jesus, my father was always frank with me and my brother because he said, David, Jesus was frank with his disciples. He was always blunt. He never sugarcoated anything. I love you enough to tell you the truth, the harsh truth. Stay away from them. Don't even look at them. Flee from them. They're not good. They're not good for you. They're not good for anyone. Run. Run away. Verse 16. So you will also be delivered from the forbidden woman. The adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth, forgets the covenant of her God, for her house sinks down to death, and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. You know, here in Proverbs 2, this woman is figurative. She represents all types of women who act differently from what should be the godly Christian norm. What kind of woman is that exactly? Uh, the metaphor, any woman who is an adulteress, prostitute, a woman whose wealth or false religion or ideologies would lead the righteous man astray. You know, Solomon writing this, you know, he would have much to say on this subject given his own experiences with foreign and forbidden women. And so I think the application for us, all of us here today, both men and women, we are all at risk of following that same path when we're careless about the pursuits we have, the idols that we've built for ourselves. When we put on the way of the world as opposed to putting on Christ. The language actually resonates and resembles the language of Paul in Ephesians 4 through 5, where we're supposed to put on the knowledge of God, the desire of God, and wisdom, while simultaneously putting off the desires and practices of sin and folly. And so I want you to imagine, you think of the clothing metaphor, that sanctification, that nice buzzword that we don't really know what it means. That it's not just physical, but it is physical in tangible ways where we can put on the righteousness of Christ. That conversion, salvation aren't just spiritual things that float around us, where we say, I'm saved, and we feel transcendent. But it's something that we put on, that when we become like Christ, when we pursue the knowledge of God and wisdom, we should be wearing something different. 
that you experience a whole transformation of your spirit and your body. Um, it's always interesting because I follow sports, you know, when you can find one of your favorite players and it's their jersey from college. Or it's their jersey from like, oh, well, this is before they played for the Ravens, when they were wherever. And it's like, well, I don't want that Bolden jersey. I want the Ravens Bolden jersey. He's on the Ravens now. And you would look at him funny. You would look at a player funny if they were still wearing their college jersey. Or if they were still wearing their old team's jersey. And how many Christians are out there where they don't want to take off the old jersey? Maybe they just they don't throw it. Maybe they just keep it in the closet for a rainy day. Yeah, we learn here when we put off the old jersey, we're to put on the new jersey. Okay? It is impossible to be able to play for the sinning team and for the winning team. Quite literally, we are to take off the sin, put on Christ. That when we pursue and find wisdom, that leads to sanctified thinking, sanctified desires. And then ultimately, this is being lived out from the inside out. So not only sanctified thinking or desires, but then sanctified living. We know too many people where their words do not line up with their actions. You know, and this reminds me actually of the mission statement, my alma mater, RTS. You know, their motto, their mission statement was quite simply a mind for truth, a heart for God. So simple, right? That's all you need, a mind for truth and a heart for God. Um, I realize now after having done that for three years, how loaded of a statement that actually is. Trying to pursue that, you know, all my professors, the classes they provided, the material that we studied, it was all academic. But it was more than academic, it was to be spiritual. As students, we were to grow in knowledge and wisdom. I sure hope so. Um, I mean, some people were saying D for degree, but I, you know, that wasn't my standard. But our bodies, our heart, our spirits, our mind, they were to grow closer to Christ in our studies, not apart from Him. We didn't go to puff ourselves up, but to be able to serve others. And I think Solomon reminds us here, you need to watch those you surround yourself with. You need to watch out for what tempts you, distracts you from what is right. Ask yourself, does this help or hinder my relationship with Christ? Yes, desire wisdom. I pray that you would also desire the reward of sanctified desires that comes with it. Ask yourself, do I have a mind for truth and a heart for God? I know so many people with minds, plenty of people with hearts, but you must have both. The Christian, mature Christian, possesses both. And as it works its way from your mind, making the furthest journey ever, 18 inches, what, what happens in your mind affects your heart. And then it flows out into the physical world where we also not just have the reward of wisdom or sanctified desires, but even our physical surroundings are blessed. These final verses, verses 20 through 22, they are a summary for the whole poem. Like much of the Psalms, Proverbs 2 reminds us of the cosmic, the eternal consequences that are stored up based off every practical daily decision. That every step we take, I pray that we are moving further to the Lord and not further from Him. That these blessings, these ifs, are determined by how you conform or not conform to the Lord's order and creation. I think of Jesus' uh, Jesus's words to Cain 
when he tells him, don't you know that if you do well, if you do well, then it will go well for you. Does this mean life will all of a sudden be rainbows and sunshine all the time? No. But there is still the promise of the Father to the Son in verse 20 that you will walk in the way of the good. You will keep to the paths of the righteous, for the upright will inhabit the land. Those with integrity will remain in it. And a word of warning, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. I mean, that's an ultimatum. You live in the land or be cut off from the land, there is no middle ground. I think a lot of us, we too easily live with the mentality of, you know, this is not our home. We're just passing through. Wisdom tells us, this is our home, it's fallen and broken, And we need Christ to come back and redeem it. Wisdom tells us there's full life in this world, spiritually and physically. Wisdom tells us, watch out for the bad company, keeps us in the good company. And so I look at these verses, I think about, you know, all the questions we could ask. Do you inherit the land? Will you be cut off? Do we or do I too easily give in to my temptations? Do I follow what I want to hear or believe or do I follow the truth? Have I become who I surround myself with? I know if it's with everyone at St. Paul's, it's a yes and it's a good thing, Um, right? Do I want Christ? Do I want all that has been freely offered to me in his life and death and resurrection, or do I want my way on my terms all of the time? Brothers and sisters, I think we are promised that those who walk in God's ways, they are, will inherit the earth, a physical blessing, a day when heaven itself is going to descend on this physical planet. God will dwell with us as his saints who have followed the Lamb, we've reflected His righteousness, His wisdom in this world. You know, we learned in Sunday school this morning, 1 Corinthians 1, you know, that what we believe is folly to those who are perishing. But to us, those who are being saved, is the power of God. We try to have wisdom, that which the world would say is foolish, but we know what God has used as foolishness in the world is just to shame the wise, using weak to shame the strong, because his foolishness is wiser than the wisdom of man. His weakness is stronger than the strength of man. And so I pray as we live wisely, in this span between Christ's resurrection and the final coming of his kingdom, that in this waiting period, we would pursue that justice as he's defined it, righteousness as he has defined it, uprightness as he has defined it, that you would be wise in avoiding those people and temptations that bring the world into disrepair, that this chapter of Proverbs would be a manual for you, in your welfare, and quite frankly, that as you pursue Christ, pursue wisdom, sanctified desires, physical blessings, that as simply as I can put it, that you would have a mind for truth, a heart for God, that you would not have that, well, now I'm saved, so there's nothing left to worry about mentality, but that's cyclical, that the more you love God, the more you want to know about him, and the more you know about him, the more you love him, and you just keep going. Amen.